welcome to everyone at our talk at the open ai plus data forum i'm shivai and with me is rishit and today the topic of our presentation is federated machine learning with, with the help of kubernetes so a very quick introduction about ourselves i'm shivai i'm a developer advocate at milsearch and also a contributor at layer 5 uh, which has a few projects like meshri that come under the cncf landscape over to you rishit hello i'm rishit i'm a high school student and an incoming student at the university of toronto I'm pretty excited about machine learning, and most of the time you'll find me creating machine learning uh, open source projects or contributing to uh, projects, including but not limited to Kubernetes, TensorFlow, uh, Kubeflow, and more. Well, over the past decade or two, machine learning has kind of become the central point for a number of different applications around a huge variety of domains. and it's probably uh, unimaginable to find a domain uh, where machine learning or data science might not actually being used so fields ranging from healthcare to autonomous vehicles uh, have been transformed with the help of machine learning techniques and uh, machine learning important specifically within these real world applications uh, has brought uh, to us uh, brought us uh, to a really new field as well and that's ml ops because uh, today machine learning is not just uh, for use case like you know being able to write a model and then uh, use the inference today machine learning is also being used in production and that essentially brings us to the point of how we can actually leverage the use of machine learning with the help of devops as well to make machine learning production ready and make it scalable at the same time so that's where uh, being able to actually run machine learning not just in larger applications but also in very small uh, resource limited applications uh, as well and that's what we are actually going to be exploring in today's presentation uh, over to you rishit uh, so uh, interestingly uh, it, it might be uh, it might be a really nice uh, a time to put it uh, over there that uh, a lot of data is created on the edge uh, take your standard smartphones for example and if you think about it a lot of the data that you might want to train your machine learning model with uh, is actually created on the edge and um, you would want to be able to leverage all of these data that is created on the edge and traditionally how machine learning systems have worked is uh, you have an edge device uh, which has all of this data and uh, there is a central model on the server uh, the model is being run on the server it sends any predictions to uh, your mobile device mobile devices in our case uh, are representative of any edge device so it sends the predictions to your mobile device and uh, the mobile device with the data that is created on the edge would uh, probably send feedback to the server and server would probably retrain the model uh, so this is a this is a very standard approach that has been uh, used for a lot of time and uh, this has worked for a lot of applications as well and you just scale it out and you get multiple edge devices giving multiple feedbacks the server is retraining on all of that data but uh, with the centralized approach uh, uh, there also come the questions of uh, uh, how how good is it in terms of latency because each time you are making a network call uh, Oh, you also require network for that uh, because you are probably making an HTTP call. Uh, uh, what about privacy? Uh, sending user data directly to the server uh, so that the in terms of feedback, so the server could retrain on it. And this is also power uh, highly power consuming. So all of these uh, all of these uh, shortcomings with the traditional approach is what led to something we call machine learning on the edge. yeah and that that's where like you know we talk about how uh, our primary goal actually being that how we can actually balance the accuracy but also at the same time we are aware of the resource constraints that come with machine learning on the edge because of the factor of uh, limited resources and to compute power the goal is to optimize uh, the accuracy with the runtime resource consumption as well now of course uh, typically you might look at this problem with a couple of different steps so the first approach that you could actually take is to actually take the existing larger models and then try to compress them down in size that are more uh, better focused towards being able to actually run on the edge now one of the other techniques that comes to mind is uh, essentially kind of a bottom up approach where we take new math 
and we actually build uh, these machinery models from scratch where your predictor classes are actually specially designed for these uh, resource constant environments and they are much more well better suited for a uh, smaller competition footprint. But of course, uh, the approach that we are seeing uh, today is uh, that how we can actually take the tasks that help to compute our machine learning models on the edge uh, by first actually taking uh, some of these tasks that can actually be uh, compute, uh, computed on the edge itself while sending some of the more uh, resource intensive tasks uh, directly to a cloud data center. So being able to actually uh, combine both uh, the uh, being able to actually do the computational directly on the edge device itself while sending the rest of the data to a cloud server where it can be done there. And then of course you're managing uh, the results that come from the cloud and then are interpreted on the cloud itself. And this actually helps us to uh, use this in a number of different uh, real world scenarios. And there are actually some existing uh, applications that are utilizing machine learning on the edge, including things like uh, a lot of voice devices such as Amazon Echo or Google Home. And then of course they're being utilized in a number of different uh, uh, educational and healthcare applications such as being able to actually uh, utilize machine learning on the edge with predictive sensors. And in the future, we might see uh, being able to actually use machine learning on the edge for things such as uh, being able to manage your patient heart, uh, heart levels, uh, glucose levels, uh, being able to use them in uh, cameras, motion sen uh, sensors as well. And of course, the main idea is to actually process most of this data locally on the edge to also provide more uh, safer uh, inference as well. So this paradigm talks about inference on the edge and well, that solves one part of the problem, but uh, today we'll be uh, talking mainly about, as you might have guessed on the title, and now we come to federated learning. And uh, we talked about how we went from centralized training to inference on the edge, but federated learning takes a step forward from there, uh, not just inference on the edge. But uh, we pose the question, can we do the training on device? Uh, because uh, in, in the inference on the edge scenario still, uh, we would have to, it only solves a part of the problems. A lot of the data that is created on the edge uh, needs to, uh, you need to train a model with that. Uh, so, okay, so how do you do training on device? Uh, because training is one of the more computationally intensive tasks. Uh, and uh, you you could, uh, and there are a couple of problems you face with, uh, let's say, just taking all of your training code, which was on the server earlier, and putting it on your mobile device. Uh, again, mobile device is representative of any edge device uh, in for, for the purpose of this talk. But uh, just putting your algorithm, which was used to train a model on the server on a mobile device, might not work due to a couple of problems. Uh, first and foremost, uh, there is often too little data. Uh, a single edge device will often create a lot, uh, too little data to train a proper machine learning model. And uh, there also comes the problem that other devices are not contributing. So uh, you'll probably have deployed your machine learning model to multiple edge devices. None of those other devices are contributing to the improvement of the model. Each of them are probably training their own model in this setting. So the answer to all of these questions and uh, also the answer to can we do the training on device question is fe uh, federated learning and in comes federated learning. So uh, a, a very uh, a high level overview of uh, federated learning and then we'll of course move to demos seeing this in practice. But uh, uh, what we want, uh, but in the case of federated learning, what we want is multiple clients or edge devices to collaborate and learn a combined model uh, because you also want probably the other clients uh, to have an impact on the model uh, and edge devices running. Uh, but how, and these would probably be coordinated by a central server, but then comes the question, how do you uh, preserve the privacy? Because you don't also don't want the raw data to be uh, shared. So that is something uh, uh, we need to take a look at. And uh, uh, let's see like uh, how, how we can not share raw data, but uh, still, still uh, do federated learning and do the training on device uh, while also being able to uh, use, the, use the data or use the model being trained on 
data uh, by other devices or other clients. So the way this works is, uh, uh, well, uh, you have an initial model on the server uh, and you also have that initial model on your edge device. Uh, the edge device trains the initial model with a little bit of data it has. So uh, there you have the locally trained model trained with very little bit of data that is collected on the edge device. And um, uh, this is a very simple task, so you can probably do it on uh, on the edge device very easily. And uh, right now, let's just say the locally trained model is uh, being shared. But what actually happens here is the updates from the initial model to the locally trained model are actually being shared. But uh, uh, if you see that the raw data is not being exchanged at all. So the locally trained model would come to the server and uh, you'd probably have this on for multiple edge devices. All of them would send in their locally trained model and uh, no exchange of data. And you'd probably apply some aggregator function uh, to create a, uh, to create a collaborative or a combined model uh, using learnings from all of these. And uh, if this seems like uh, too simple of an idea, uh, well, you have to probably do it multiple times uh, to get uh, to learn from uh, the data collected by all of these. So the combined model now becomes your initial model and you uh, repeat this process again. So it is pretty interesting uh, how federated learning in a moment just uh, tackled all the problems we had uh, with being able to train on, uh, train on the device while maintaining privacy, speed and all of that. So uh, for the motivated reader, you could actually take a look at uh, uh, this paper from 2018 uh, about how federated learning is being used for uh, uh, Google key, Keyboard. Um, it is a pretty interesting paper on how they use federated learning uh, in Google Keyboard at scale. Uh, so that might be something interesting to see for the motivated reader, a listener. Uh, so what we'll be talking about today, uh, the demos we'll be seeing today will also be about TFF, that is TensorFlow Federated. Uh, which is an open source framework for machine learning and other computations on decentralized data. Uh, so we'll also be taking a look at TensorFlow Federated. And uh, uh, though we talk about machine learning all this time, uh, you are not limited to, well, machine learning. The idea of federated learning, the idea of applying computations to distributed data without sharing the data to a server or without sharing or without getting the data out of your edge device uh, is not just limited to machine learning and there's a ton of things uh, you can apply the ideas we uh, talked about today to uh, for one analytics uh, is a very booming field uh, where federated uh, federated algorithms are very commonly applied uh, and it's well not machine learning so you can definitely take the ideas we talk uh, we talk about and we'll show in the demos to computations which are not machine learning. So we'll be taking a look at TensorFlow Federated uh, as well as uh, how you can uh, use Kubernetes to uh, simulate uh, or to simulate multiple devices in the demos. So now we come to the interesting part that is demos and uh, uh, let, uh, let's get on to that. So now we'll be looking at a federated learning demo and uh, We'll try to uh, we'll try to create a federated machine learning algorithm uh, using TensorFlow Federated, and this will not be a deep dive. Uh, and we are essentially just using the federated learning APIs to uh, give you an intro to federated learning. If you are more excited about uh, federated learning, or probably want to add in your own computations, uh, you would you could definitely build on top of what we show in this demo. But due to time constraints, we'll actually be uh, we'll actually just show a minimalistic demo of uh, training of federated machine learning algorithm. A minimalistic but complete demo of training of federated machine learning algorithm. So uh, let's start out by uh, getting the input data. So uh, what? So in this example, what we'll be doing is we'll be uh, using the MNIST dataset. And there is essentially an EMNIST dataset which is uh, built for federated learning. And you'll see why this is built for federated learning. Uh, but, um, so, but something we'll be uh, doing is uh, we also want to see how federated learning um, 
data sets might be different and though this is just a famous MNIST data set uh, but uh, in, a, in a federated learning uh, environment uh, so the MNIST data set is essentially a set of handwritten numbers and your goal is to create a machine learning algorithm to classify or to classify them and uh, uh, what we want to see is uh, there are uh, so in our case we now have a lot of different clients each of them have their own data set locally collected data set uh, we, because as we talked about a lot of data is actually created on the edge so um, so let's take a look at uh, the data sets we have and if we, if you see like all of these data sets uh, all of these different colors of graphs uh, of bins actually represent uh, different numbers uh, because it's a handwritten digit data set so not all of them have the same uh, the same number of examples and this is very much expected because not all of your clients or edge devices would have the same kind of data another is this example so this is like a mean of all the uh, images in the data set and just as an example if you see uh, the data set that client one has the like two over your and the two on the data set that client two has is very different uh, those are just two different styles of how people write twos and uh, this is because the data is collected locally so as a user everyone would have different styles of writing a two and uh, so the federated learning data sets for all of these clients are actually pretty heterogeneous uh, they are of uh, they are pretty different in their style they are pretty different in the distribution of the data and not all of them even have the same number of examples so uh, th this also in a sense uh, just shows you uh, what we talked about why is there a need for collaborative learning why others why other uh, edge devices should also contribute to the machine learning model well just to show you the data sets on our different devices are actually different uh, next we want to pre-process the data and um, this is essentially very simple steps. Uh, what we are doing is uh, creating a set of uh, two sets of uh, tensors, uh, essentially uh, X tensor, which contains the pixel values of the image and a Y tensor, which contains the labels. Uh, so this is a 28 by 28 image. Uh, we are just converting it to a, a 28 by 28 image to a one cross 784 image. Uh, you already know you can simply convert a 28 by 28 image into a 1 cross 70, 784 image very easily. Uh, so that is what we are doing over here. We are also adding them into batches. So uh, so we are also adding them into batches uh, of data sets. Uh, so uh, that is all that we do in this pre-processing step. And if you see, um, we are, this is actually the... Uh, data, uh, this is actually one batch of uh, data set we have uh, from a particular client. This is one batch of the data set. Uh, we have the X values. All of these are a single image. Uh, this is a 1 cross 784 image. Uh, this is a 1 cross 784 image and so on. Uh, all of these are the Y values, which uh, just represents uh, what is the number of, uh, oh, what is the number of, oh, oh what number it is in the image. Uh, so a uh, very simple up until now, and we'll just uh, pre-process our data in this sense. What we do, uh, what we do next uh, is, um, so if you remember, we uh, earlier put in that we want 10 clients. So what we have is essentially 10 different data sets. So uh, another thing I just wanted to put out over there is um, in, uh, in an ideal scenario, you'd um, probably have like multiple devices probably a thousand devices and then you would choose 10 or so devices out of it uh, um, but in our case we just have 10 data sets so we are assuming that the selection process is already done so ideally you would want to do the selection process some way uh, let's say a mobile device again this is representative of edge devices but let's say when a mobile device is being charged and is not on a uh, and is not uh, and is let's say on a high speed Wi-Fi uh, connected to a high speed Wi-Fi, that might be the best time to 
uh, that might be the best time to train your model and send out the updates of the model to the server um since it would be uh, no uh, not a very big uh constraint on the mobile at this time it is already being charged and uh, you are also uh, and you, and you also have a, a decent connection so you would ideally want to sync your devices this way but uh, in this example you are thinking that uh, oh wait you already selected your devices and now you have to send data sets um the data set to a model part uh, will would be done on the client itself and the client would then just send the updates so we'll get on with that part and we'll just think that there are only 10 clients all of them have their own data set which we just created so uh, now you can actually define a simple kris model so of course you can uh, modify this as well uh, and one of the things uh, uh, you can also do is not just use this uh, not just use this idea for federated machine learning but all kinds of applications on distributed uh, decentralized data uh, so you you can also implement them with tensorflow federated you can implement other kinds of computations for distributed data as well Uh, and you don't necessarily need to have a kris model you can customize all the computations that go in as well for the purpose of this example we'll simply use a kris model a very simple neural network and um, we'll wrap it up um, as a tff.learning.model so this method actually creates a tensorflow federated model out of this so for a tensorflow federated model um uh Uh, it will take in a kris model and then create a tensorflow federated model out of it uh, uh you can think of it as a, a wrapper for our uh, kris our simple kris model uh, of course this can be any model you want here it's just a simple neural uh, now we want to um so the other important part was the federated averaging algorithm so if you think about it we actually have two optimizers over here so as you might have already guessed Uh, one of the part of getting the updates from the trained model uh, is on the client side uh, on the client side you train a model then get the updates and send those updates to the server the server then also has to uh, cre- create a new model uh, which is represented of the updates which it has gotten from uh, all the other devices and apply them to the initial model it had on the server so it needs to apply these updates to the initial model it had and that would be on the server which is why we have two optimizers over here uh are two different optimizers over here so as an example if you just see uh, so uh, this uh, so the tensorflow uh, federated uh tensorflow federated actually puts all of these into a single iterative process and uh, Oh, uh, and what you can also see is um, let let's say this is for the uh, so this is a simple example of what uh, what things are there on the server. So the server essentially has a global model. The weights for the global model. Uh, it has the distributor, uh, uh, which is uh, which would be required for the client-server interaction. It has the aggregator and then the finalizer. We already talked about these components earlier, and uh, now it might be. uh now it might come properly into the picture uh if you remember the diagram well so uh, that is what we are doing over here and um, so we also have uh, so we can do a simple round of it um uh, uh, so we can do a simple round of it uh, using dot next that turns a simple round so how does a round go uh, a round goes if you remember the very first image when we saw federated learning so a round uh, Uh, so so a round uh, takes the initial model uh, gets uh, gets the updates from all the different devices aggregates those updates and updates the initial model on the server uh, we probably need to do this multiple times but uh, that is how a single round is here are uh, defined so we actually run a single round and uh, as i talked about earlier you probably want to do this multiple times right uh, so that is why we'll just put it up in a for loop uh, as simple as that and um, run this round for multiple times if you, if, if you actually see over here uh, if you see the losses over here uh, the losses are actually decreasing on the uh, accuracy of the model the model being able to 
classify an images is actually increasing uh, this is just now for 10 rounds you could do this for a lot more rounds uh, and it would of course increase by a lot more yeah uh, let's run this again for hmm, 10 more rounds so if i just run this again for 10 more rounds i can see that the accuracy is still improving uh, and oh i just ran it for a single round sorry so let's run it for 10 more rounds and uh, i can see the accuracy is actually increasing the losses are actually the loss values are actually decreasing so the model is uh, improving over time and um, this is happening from 10 different clients none of them are actually sharing the data they collected on device and we are still able to create a better model taking the learnings from all of the data that is collected on device so this is um, so this is a, a great introductory example to federated learning and next up we'll see how we can run this simulation in a kubernetes cluster so the next demo we'll see is um, how how you can simulate this for a number of devices in a kubernetes cluster uh, which also makes it easy or uh, e- easy to simulate this or run federated learning algorithms so uh, Uh, we'll actually uh, use the pretty a uh, pretty similar code uh, that we used last time it's essentially the same neural network uh, essentially everything is uh, almost the same uh, so we'll uh, so you you might see that this is a pretty similar code uh, as the last one we'll just um, uh, so uh, we we'll use the similar code as we did in the last time but uh, this time around we'll also uh have a we also will try to simulate the same the same model the same training of the model in a kubernetes cluster so let's try to do that and uh, the first thing i'll do is uh, i already have a kubernetes cluster up you could create this anywhere you want and uh, uh there it is i have uh, three nodes on my kubernetes cluster already up so Uh, first what i'll do is i'll create a deployment uh, uh for the tff workers um, and uh, this will use the tensorflow federated uh i they also provide an image so you could do remote execution very easily essentially uh, you, you remotely execute uh, all the federated learning algorithms uh, that will probably write over here so every time like you make a round uh, all of that will uh, happen on different uh will happen on different uh instead of the clients that you uh that we had in our on our own system uh they were uh, not even clients just different data sets this time around we'll have a proper simulation to do that um uh, think of it as a simulation in a kubernetes system so we'll create this deployment to start off with and um, this has actually been created so what i'll do now is also create a load balancer uh and uh, we can probably use this we'll now use this to uh, run our uh, to run our uh, to run our federated learning algorithms so this shows me that my load balancer external ip is still pending uh, okay now we have it so let's get our ip and we'll actually use grpc to uh, run our code um, to uh, to run the federated learning algorithm taking this as a serial so there it is i have in my ip address and i'll actually do the same example create 10 clients but this time around it will be much like a proper simulation so um, and all of this happens in a kubernetes cluster uh, so let's run this and now we'll run the evaluate function so what the evaluate function is is essentially running the one round so the evaluate function runs all of these rounds and uh, let's say run it for 20 round 20 rounds so we we'll now run the same algorithm we had earlier for 20 rounds so let's execute this again and then we'll uh, just call the evaluate function but this time around uh, as i told uh, this is actually running like a proper simulation
already run the evaluate function for you for 20 bucks. It was taking quite a bit of time, so I just put it up. And uh, uh, there you have it, a uh, simulation of the, uh, of the same code, the same model uh, for 20 rounds and Kubernetes. So uh, that was about the uh, second demo. All right. So thank you so much for uh, attending our talk. In case you have any questions, uh, do feel free to reach out to us on our Twitter handles, Hardwellup and Richard underscore Deggy. And in case, uh, of course, now we are open to questions. So we'd like to take up any questions. And of course, we would love to see you next year in person at Open Source Summit Latin America. Thank you very much.